Um, and now I think we have Garoj next. So Garoj, over to you. Great, thank you um, very much, Claire, and thank you for the invite to speak today. And I'm delighted to talk and bring together um, two major components of our work at GLAN. Um, hopefully, everyone can hear me okay. Can I just do a sound check before I start? Because I have a message saying I'm muted. Sound perfect to me, Garrett. Okay, great, great, thanks. Um, today, I, I'm going to try and um, speak to the theme of this panel by giving an overview of the um, overarching strategy that we've taken towards migration and climate change. And I think it's important, first off, to just introduce who we are and how we operate um, uh, as an organization. The Global Legal Action Network was founded in 2016 and is comprised of a combination of legal practitioners, academics and investigative journalists. Um, we have a staff of five with offices in the UK and Ireland. Um, and our, our mandate is to pursue legal actions across borders that challenge powerful actors uh, involved with systemic injustice. So that's our very, I suppose, a succinct way of describing our mandate. Um, hopefully my transition changes here, yeah. And our vision is justice beyond borders. So we are exclusively transnational. And I'll give you some concrete examples of what this looks like in due course. And uh, part of what we focus on in the criteria for selecting cases is that, is that we aim to tackle serious human rights abuses, as well as the systems that underpin them. So for us, this is what it means to be strategic, to affect long-term change across borders. Um, we cannot just focus on the symptoms, you know, the physical act that results in a, a human rights harm. We must also be paying equal, if not more, attention to the drivers and systems that sustain them in the longer term. And this explains why we have quite a broad um, areas, well, broad areas of focus, which I'll quickly um, take you through now. Um, here are the four major themes which, uh, within which our work falls. And we see them as being interlinked and interconnected in various ways. And indeed, our cases are equally interconnected, if, even if they fall within uh, these discrete themes. Um, we only have to think about uh, the complexity of climate change from an environmental perspective, as well as the, 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 the complexity of migration as an issue. And the interconnection between the two um, is a challenging area to combat from a litigation perspective. Um, we believe that because these phenomena are transnational, complex, and um, nuanced, that any strategy that aims to tackle the intersection between migration and, and climate change ought to be equally sophisticated, transnational, and nuanced. And this is our, what we are striving for as part of our work. Um, first of all, I'll quickly take you through our work on migration and try and link it in then with our climate change finishing up with our most recent submission to the European Court of Human Rights. Some of this theme, uh, these cases overlap slightly with the panel before, but I do think it's worth um, showing how we first focus not only on the symptoms, but also the systems, as I described already. So with migration and border violence, we have uh, taken a, a, a large number of cases. I'll, I'll give you three examples today to, to look at how we um, construct our cases, the tools we use, and the impacts we are seeking to achieve. Um, we focused heavily on the European Union's contribution um, to human rights violations through the provision of um, financial aid and support uh, to actors at the periphery of Europe as part of its externalization campaign, which aims to avoid responsibility for the EU and its member states. And this includes policies in the central Mediterranean, and the collaboration between EU institutions, Italy, and the Libyan authorities, including the Libyan Coast Guard. Um, we've sought to challenge and seek redress for the dire human rights, con human, human rights consequences these policies um, have elicited through um, three cases, as I mentioned. Um, 
One includes SS in Italy, which has been communicated to member states. And there have been, I think, in excess of a dozen interventions, which are all available on our website. And this examined uh, or scrutinized, um, or was a submission made to the European Court of Human Rights, scrutinizing the collaboration between Italy and the Libyan Coast Guard in pushbacks resulting in human rights violation. Um, and this is part of this, um, and the case has been dubbed Hersey uh, 2.0, in that it is um, uh, the evolution of Italy trying to avoid its responsibilities. With Hersey, it was um, an attempt to intercept in the high seas and to act beyond the territorial, beyond the territory of Italy. And the court slapped that back and said um, human rights obligations continue to apply. In SS in Italy, uh, we were looking at how the Libyan Coast Guard interfered with um, uh, the rescue by Sea Watch 3 of 130 migrants on a sinking, di sinking dinghy in um, uh, yeah, at the end of 2017, where at least 20 of the migrants died. The Libyan vessel itself had been donated by, the, by Italy a few months previously, and the intervention by the Libyan Coast Guard was coordinated by Rome, from Rome by the Maritime Rescue and Coordination Centre there, uh, an, an, an Italian government agency, and an Italian Navy ship uh, was nearby, part of the Maro Securo operation, which uh, has operated in Libyan territorial waters, um, thereby facilitating the Libyan Coast Guard. So this was a really sophisticated form of contactless control that Italy was trying to uh, uh, implement um, to uh, deter migration. And we argued that the, the effective control that Italy had over this gave rise to or triggered its, its responsibilities under the convention. Um, and that case is, is pending before the court. As part of this, we work closely with forensic architects forensic oceanography, um, who are just maestros in being able to combine mobile phone footage, satellite image, radar, uh, to create compelling reconstructions that really assisted our legal analysis and challenging these pushbacks. Um, yeah, and their work, again, is, is um, available online and, and primarily led by uh, Lorenzo Rosani and Charles Heller. Um, I should mention as well that the other cases we've been involved in are, include the Niven incident. Um, this is really you know, a further evolution or deterioration in the Mediterranean as a result of the closed port policy and the progressive criminalization of rescue NGOs. Um, and this has led to the retreat um, of the European Union search and rescue missions at sea and left a gap in the Mediterranean, one that's been filled by um, merchant vessels and um, the Libyan Coast Guard. And merchant vessels have become this unwilling participant in uh, the strategic delegation of border control by the likes of Italy. And they have been forced to intervene, take on board migrants and take them back to, to Libya. And we filed a complaint on behalf of a survivor um, of the, the Niven incident in uh, December 2019 with the UN Human Rights Committee arguing again this, this another form of contactless control ought to trigger Italy's responsibilities and, and sought a finding of a violation of um, uh, convention rights. Um, and this is the first time such an intervention has been uh, made on the issue of privatized pushbacks. Um, and uh, an, another aspect we've been looking at again from a more systemic because you know really we are focusing on slight symptoms there um, dramatic incidents of interventions on the high seas um, resulting in harm. A lot of these migrants were sold into slavery or suffering enormous uh, abuse upon return to Libya. Um, another work, other work led by uh, Valentina Razarova, um, who was part of our, um, our legal action committee, uh, focused on uh, the allocation of EU funds to reducing migration and stopping migration boats uh, ultimately do the development money which is pouring into Libya without human rights conditions or systems for monitoring human rights abuses. So it's kind of a, a carte blanche for the, the use of this uh, incredible amounts of money, upwards of 90 million as I mentioned. And through this arrangement um, largely implemented by Italy, the EU is facilitating, or we argue they're facilitating and perpetuating the abuse of, of refugees. Um, and this is submitted to the uh, European Court of Auditors, arguing for the suspension of funding to the EU's program um, and uh, highlighting the failure to conduct any form of human rights uh, due diligence or monitoring and, and pushing for change in that regard. Um, 
so, so this is our starting point on migration. And now what I'd like to do is to move into look at how we uh, tie this in with other str strands of work. We're, we're, I, I suppose we don't have one case that encapsulates a direct overlap of uh, climate change and, and, and migration. And I think that's understandable because it is, as I said, a complex issue. Um, so we don't have you know, uh, something akin to the, the Kiribati uh, climate refugee case, um, which was decided on in January of this year by the UN Human Rights Committee. Rather, it's a more of a, a strategic arc looking at the intersection of the two. Um, our second theme then, looking at environmental and economic justice, I think ties in with the migration work, because ultimately we need to, if we're thinking systematically, we should be thinking of what drives uh, these communities or individuals um, to, to migrate. Migration is a response. It's a response to um, circumstances and potentials. Um, most migrants um, cite economic migrants cite a uh, hopelessness as one of the main uh, reasons for that propels them to move across borders and respond to their situation. And we've been looking at a variety of issues in the way in which wealthy countries are implicated in the creation of those, of those situations to which migrants are, are, are fleeing. Um, we have work uh, on tax justice, looking at how profit shifting um, by large multinationals headquartered in Europe um, are depriving uh, um, developing countries of key funds that would otherwise support their public services. And we have um, a submission to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, and we're hoping to have um, Ireland examined and its approach to um, uh, uh, trade negotiations with developing countries and the manner in which um, they are profit shifting and um, securing uh, the uh, I suppose the, the, the vast quantities of monies from large multinational corporations in their own, I suppose, tax haven. Um, and this, you know, profit shifting is particularly damaging um, because developing countries are more dependent on corporate tax income than richer countries. And we're hoping that the, uh, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child will assess whether Ireland's tax policy undermines the ability of these countries to raise revenue that be, could be vital for things like healthcare. And we've used tools um, pioneered in the University of Stirling, looking at how, ways in which you can empirically measure when you deprive a certain amount of money from a developing country through such policies, aggressive tax shifting policies, what impact does it have on things like child mortality? And um, we expect, uh, we, we hope the committee takes this issue up. Likewise, with climate change, I don't need to reiterate our understanding and the threat it poses to human rights. Um, but here we've, we prioritize our work um, on land grabbing uh, through a climate change lens and that we see the stewardship of natural resources and forests by local and indigenous communities as being key to uh, a, clim a climate change solution. Um, one of our uh, current cases includes the island of Barbuda, where our following a hurricane uh, vast quantities of forest were seized by the government, uh, effectively ending a, a common age tenure system that the islanders had in place for over I think, 120 years uh, to create an, an airport, an international airport that, was, that would then service a new tourism resort, or I should say a billionaire resort on a nearby lagoon, which is also a protective wetland, which provides um, uh, protection to a very low-lying island, um, which is, you know, uh, as prone to rising sea levels and we've been looking at ways in which we can tackle uh, the failures of the government but also the multinational corporations involved in that um, and yeah again arguing that the uh, islanders and control of these resources ought to remain with the islanders who have kept it in a, in a uh, an admirable state uh, and ultimately leading to the protection of the island and uh, our, our broader international um, uh, atmosphere um, in, in terms of direct climate change work, um, we in 2017 we started crowdfunding for an ambitious case uh, that we sought to sue for all 47 members of the Council of Europe uh, for their failure to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions that was resulting in harm for uh, six uh, Portuguese children, um, or, or sorry, young people. There's a mix, a range of ages. 
And um, this led, led us to engage more deeply with um, climate change um, and include led to uh, such initiatives as the drafting of Ireland's fossil fuel divestment bill, which is a world first, which gives a blueprint for other countries to divert their public money from um, fossil fuel enterprises and has already resulted in a significant amount of Ireland's um, uh, public, public purse being uh, redirected. And um, over the intervening uh, three years, we worked um, exhaustively on this climate change case, which I'll uh, just quickly run through now. Um, uh, we filed the case on September 3rd of this year, and it is the first time that climate change has been brought before the European Court of Human Rights against 30 plus countries, um, uh, 33 in total, who are signatories to the European Convention. Uh, this includes um, uh, the EU, EU bloc, um, the UK, Norway, Ukraine, and Russia and Turkey. Uh, and the case was brought on behalf, as I mentioned, these six Portuguese young adults who are from uh, parts of Lisbon that are the worst affected by forest fires in 2017 and 2018, which killed in excess of um, 150 people. And we argued that by contributing to global warming, uh, which far exceeds 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, the temperature targets set by the Paris Agreement, that the, the states are violating the human rights of the mm -hmm. applicants involved. Um, the case focuses on the ever-increasing future threat which climate change poses to their right to life, privacy, and the peaceful enjoyment of their possessions. And um, the, uh, they also argue, as a result of their age, they're being discriminated against as young people by the failure to properly tar target uh, climate change. Um, and for them, the harms are very real, and we mobilized <clears throat> expert evidence showing how climate change is currently affecting them and will affect them in the future, um, and how the uh, Portugal as a climate change hotspot uh, is experiencing ever-increasing uh, temperature extremes. Uh, during the for preparation of our case, Lisbon set a new temperature record of 44 degrees Celsius. Um, it also affects the ways, in, you know, in very measurable ways, uh, the amount of time they can spend outdoors, they can exercise, an interruption to their sleep. And um, in Portugal, within their lifetime, it is expected that or anticipated that they will exp experience heat waves above 40 degrees Celsius for 30 days or more, um, which again uh, brings into question, and again in the sub Saharan context, especially the habitability of certain areas. Um, their ability to sustain life and thereby triggering migration. This is one of the first cases as well where we, we were operating within the global north, but we see it as an important proxy um, for uh, the claims and the interests of communities in the global south. Uh, slightly clumsy categorization, I know, but um, here we are focusing on the periphery of, of Europe um, uh, to uh, highlight um, what the centre ought to be doing. Um, and and I, I, I can talk more about this case, but Claire, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I should probably try and wrap up, um, but I'm happy to talk more about um, the, the case itself and um, how it seeks to overcome some of the shortcomings within the Paris Agreement. And maybe I can leave those for questions and answers. Um, is that okay, Claire? Yeah. Wonderful, Garrod. Thank you so much. And um, yes, an, another prompt to those that are listening, please take Garrod up on that and do send some questions. This is really a pioneering case. Um, I think what's interesting about it as well is it shows the potential of the European Convention of Human Rights in this instance to really live up to its, to its reputation as a living instrument, as something that can evolve to meet the challenges we're facing, you know, the challenges we're facing today are not the same as we faced 70 years ago, but that convention needs to keep up to date with that. Um, and, you know, we're not immune from migration or climate-induced migration here in the global north or in Europe, as, 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 we, as we refer to them. Um, and this is something that we can see even within Europe coming down the line, and we need to be wary of that. And also, I mean, speaking about taxation, um, it was really interesting to hear about that. It shows the pervasiveness of, you know, these cross-sectoral issues and how it all ties in from banking sector to, to so many areas, really. Um, it, it's really interlinked. So thank you for that, Garrod. Um, and quickly. now it's, over, it's time to move on to Michaela. Yes, sorry, Garrod. No, it's fine. I, I, I was just a quick response. And one thing I should do to wrap it up and bring it back to my initial point is that if the case is successful, um, 
states would be legally bound not only to increase their emission lines and cut with what science demands, but they would have to take responsibility for contributions to emissions overseas. And that includes um, allowing multinationals based within these countries um, or measuring the contributions of multinationals based within these countries who contribute to the global emissions um, through their overseas operations in places like um, Sub-Saharan Africa where migrants are coming from, uh, where they directly contribute to further harms locally. Um, and I think that's what ties it all back. But sorry, I'll, I'll end there. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Gareth. Something to talk about perhaps in the discussion afterwards.